Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending June 6th. First up, this article was sent to me by Gentleman's Nine. As a matter of fact, there will be an upcoming video because this TDD report is going to be slightly late because I had the uh, great pleasure to have lunch with Gentleman's Nine and his wife. He stopped by and we did a little bit of work on his wife's bike just to do a minor repair to keep it going and went out to lunch. So um, you will see that video upcoming. This is an article he sent me in about Voztech helmet. This is not like a prototype helmet. This is a helmet that's actually very shortly going to be going on sale. And it's a new design that I, I myself have never seen this before. But the back part of the helmet around the back part of your head, in other words, this part right here, actually opens up like a clamshell, hinged. And because of that, this helmet does not need a chin strap. The part of the helmet with your chin actually goes underneath your chin itself. And there's a small neck opening. Now, the reason... That they, that they tried this design was because they saw a problem with normal full face helmets is that you have to have the opening to the helmet be a little extra large so people can fit their heads in it and it's especially a problem with somebody like me with glasses having to take your glasses off put the helmet down over your head but with this opening up in the rear basically you just take the helmet and place it against your face like that and then it's got an adjustable chin guard and basically it comes under and fits itself to your face and then you close down the back part of it the real part of this that I like is the fact that it has an emergency release at the top where you could take the whole back part of the helmet off as one separate piece, or in the case of a, a rider that's injured and down, you actually leave this piece on and lift the front part of the helmet away without moving the neck or doing anything like that. There's a special release that EMTs and paramedics can use to keep you totally mobilized. So to me, I think this is one of the safest designs to use should a, a rider end up being in a crash or something like that to where you cannot chance moving their neck even at all because it's next to impossible with a standard full face helmet and even with the fact of one of those modular helmets that lift up like that there's always the chance that there could be some kind of a neck movement and this way basically except for the little part in back which they could basically leave that on you and transport you total safety so if you get a chance check this out I'll give you the link below there's also a video demonstrating how this helmet works and demonstrate somebody taking it on and off, and also demonstrating how the safety release works. So a very good article. Next up, this is from the Motorik, Radiation Shield for Trip to Mars. Now one of the things that engineering is still trying to work on is a way to shield astronauts from long-term radiation exposure for a six to nine month trip to Mars. There's going to be a huge amount of cosmic rays they're exposed to, and it's just not practical to make a, a craft with three foot thick of metal shielding, which would do the job, but you know, every extra pound you have to launch is a lot, lot more fuel. Well, this RAL is what the system's called. It's called from the uh, the laboratory that actually designed it. Uh, I don't know the exact name, but you can check out in the article, but that is the name of the lab. The L stands for lab. And what they basically do is they just use an energy source and produce a magnetic field, kind of like what shields the Earth. And they've demonstrated that if you make the right kind of magnetic shield, the cosmic rays will actually deflect off. They did practical tests of this around a fusion reactor that produces the same kind of cosmic rays and it did seem to work and be effective it's just a matter of getting the right kind of power source to be able to produce this but producing a magnetic field around a spacecraft is probably going to be a lot easier engineering task than having huge thick amounts of metallic shielding to try to do the same thing so if you get a chance this is from cnn.com check this out and this article goes along with another one too speaking of fusion reactors this is going to be kind of a rant because just like the fact that France and Switzerland and Europe are heavily invested in the CERN reactor that discovered the Higgs boson, you know, they have um, the one, they're the ones that built the largest cyclotron reactor right now. They're working on the next step in fusion reactors. And this fusion reactor is called ITER, I-T-E-R. It used to be known as the International uh, thermonuclear experimental reactor but now they just call it the word ITER because the word in Latin actually means the journey or the way so they're just instead of having that acronym and trying to remember what the words it stands for they're just calling it the name ITER and what's really upsetting me is the fact the United States they're only asking the United States to come up with nine percent investment in this thing I mean not not even counting the fact that the United States isn't leading in this I don't know why in the heck we are getting so far away from science that we're not even leading in one of these different projects. It always seems to be centered around France 
or the European Union, which seemed to be really heavily invested in that. But now we're even arguing in Congress as to whether we should even put up our 9% that we originally promised to dedicate to this. I guess China, Russia, us, and uh, one or two other countries, maybe India, were all asked to just to be a part of this, but only have to invest 9%, and Europe was going to put up the bulk of the money. And now we're even kind of backing off about that and, and uh, you know, making a to-do about the 9% to invest in it because the amount of information this could possibly provide for us. I mean, you're looking, when you reach a certain point, just like with the CERN reactor, you reach a certain point and you're bound to be able to discover whether the Higgs boson exists or not. The same thing with fusion reactors. We're getting closer and closer, but you get to a certain point to where you're going to get more energy out of it than you put in. In other words, the holy grail of perpetual motion machines can actually happen when you're talking about nuclear reactions. And they're thinking about the fact there may be a 10 times return. So in other words, for, for 50 megawatts of energy put into it, you may get up to 500 megawatts of energy output. Well, once it starts happening that way to where you're getting more back than you are putting in, you've pretty much come up with a theoretical way at least to solve the world's energy problem. And then it's a matter of just engineering to make it practical. So why we're not even more fully involved in this and why the United States isn't the main player in this rather than grumbling about being a side player and getting to enjoy all the benefits from it for a 9% investment, I have no idea. Next up, this is from Baker46. This is from Wired.com. And this is uh, another update on the Voyager 1 project. Now, I know as I do these reports, we're always debating, are we past the sun's magnetic field? Have we actually entered the place in outer space to where the cosmic radiation from the galactic cosmic radiation is actually more predominant than the sun's cosmic radiation? Well, guess what? They've reached another region that theoretically they didn't even predict. For some reason now, the cosmic rays from the sun have been dropping off, but the predominant cosmic rays, instead of coming from all random directions, which was the model they did expect to happen, they're still coming predominantly from one direction. And the other thing that's happening too is they're still not detecting the galactic magnetic shield. And the reason why we should be able to detect that is because it's 60 degrees off of the sun's magnetic field. So the sun's magnetic field dominates our region of our planets, but when you get far enough away, then the magnetic field that surrounds our galaxy should be the one we're detecting more than the sun's magnetic um, field. And we're not detecting yet this 60-degree uh, incline magnetic field. So um, what they're calling it is like we're on the front foyer or the front porch with the door open, and uh, for some reason, even though they didn't predict it, the cosmic rays are coming from just one direction. So time, I guess, to rework some theories and rethink things, but... Uh, the more we get supposedly towards the edge, the more we find out things that we didn't know to start with. So who knows what will come of this. And um, this one comes from, I just actually, when I was looking around, found this from Google.com. They're actually offering the Google Street View camera as a backpack. You can apply. Anybody, I guess, especially uh, universities, nonprofits, people that do a lot of off-road and uh, backpacking into wilderness areas, they want to start mapping those regions to where a car can't drive on. So you can actually go to this link, and I will give you the link to this, and actually apply and see if Google would be willing to let you carry this backpack with 360 degrees worth of cameras pointing in all directions. And you just basically walk around with it, and every two seconds it takes a picture, and they would appreciate as many people as can get involved. I think what they're doing is probably looking to map every square inch of landmass, really, everywhere that's at least uh, walkable, if nothing else, uh, or if you can go on bicycles or... I don't know if they include dirt bikes or not, but look at the details and apply. If you think there's a chance at all, what's the worst could happen? They could say no, but you might be able to get, a, get to be a part of the Google Earth Project. I thought it was kind of cool. And this last one, this was sent in by Bangalore Bobble, the human heat-powered flashlight. This young lady, she is still in high school, and she has come up with... Now, I know other people, believe me, I know there's other similar designs to this, but I think just the way she put this together is a, is a piezo-ceramic generator of electricity combination with... Um, a flashlight design, holding it and using the heat from your hands and putting together the circuitry so that it could power the LEDs. Uh, yeah, not, maybe nothing about her plan is completely brown, groundbreaking if you've been studying this for a while, but I think just the fact of the way she put it together and the way the design she did, and as young as she is, I hope she gets a lot of scholarships because I think what she's created is something really, really fantastic. And if you get a chance, uh, check out her YouTube video. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Oh, Last thing, I want to thank you guys so much because usually by this time in the summertime I'm taking a break and the only reason why I'm not is because you guys are still so into this show. I'm getting at least 
12 people constantly submitting material and probably five or six of you on a real regular basis like every week or more than once a week submitting material. So it's keeping this show interesting. It's keeping it going. It's showing me that you guys are really interested. And I've noticed the fallout, us the fall off, usually in summertime, the, the views just fall way, way down into the basement, which is to be expected. They do on the Internet anyway. My views have just fallen off slightly, and actually the participation right now is at its highest level that I can ever remember it being at, and it's only because of you guys. So each and every one of you that is watching this, I would like to thank you very much because you guys, you guys are the whole reason why I have fun doing this and why I like to continually do this. So take care, everybody. I'll catch you next week.